am Karen Dakin, currently Secretary of the International Dyslexia Association and a longtime friend of Dr. Sylvia Onesti Richardson. I am honored to have the opportunity to interview her and ask her questions about her long and distinguished career. Early on, Sylvia was interested in language and received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Stanford University in speech and drama, intending to go into the theater. She became interested in speech language pathology at the University of Washington, where she started in their drama program and then switched to speech and language disorders. Then Sylvia found herself pursuing and receiving a Master's of Arts of Education of the Handicap from Teachers College, Columbia University, after which she pursued an MD degree from McGill University. Why, one might ask, did she go to medical school? Sylvia said that many parents sought advice from their pediatrician first when they had concerns about their child's language, and she wanted to be able to answer those questions. Sylvia has held the highest positions in several influential organizations including ASHA, the LDA, and the Orton Dyslexia Society, now the International Dyslexia Association, having been the Orton Dyslexia Society's eighth president from 1984 to 88. She has also received the highest awards from these three organizations as well as many other honors. And now it is my honor to ask Sylvia questions about her extraordinary career. When did you first become interested in dyslexia? When I was a speech pathologist, this was a long time ago, and realized that there were children who we could help who had delay in the acquisition and use of language. We could help them in speaking, but when they went to school at that time, if they couldn't read, they were put in classes for the mentally retarded or the emotionally disturbed. Now I'm talking about the 40s. It wasn't dyslexia itself, the name, that was of concern to me. What was of concern was that I knew these children were not retarded or necessarily emotionally disturbed. They needed to be taught to read because speaking is natural, reading is not. It's a learned art, it's a learned skill. Sylvia, can you share with us your educational background? I was a drama major at Stanford University, and I, I minored in philosophy, so, you know, it wasn't all. Anyhow, I went to the University of Washington for graduate school because they had the best drama coach on the mm -hmm. coast. I grew up in San Francisco, and I was in theater there, and uh, then I heard about children who couldn't communicate and, you know, for a drama major, that's a, a terrible disaster. Mm -hmm. And the University of Washington had the first course, first program in speech pathology on the entire West Coast. And I had to minor in anatomy of the head and neck. And I thought that was great because when I was a kid, I used to dissect and, and operate on my dolls. And so I thought, well, this would be fine. And Jim sent me to Columbia in speech path because, to get a PhD because they couldn't do that yet. It was a brand new program at uh, Washington University. I was working on my PhD and I was teaching in New Rochelle as a speech pathologist. I was having a hard time with some of the kids and I asked for their parents' permission to speak to their physicians and found out that the physicians didn't seem to know much about, the pediatricians didn't seem to know much about kids with language problems. And they kept talking about boys and they'd grow out of it and all this weird stuff. And frankly, I got pissed. So I went back to Columbia, made a deal, did my pre-med in a year. At that time, women were not accepted into the uh, better medical schools in this country. McGill in Montreal, which is one of the best medical schools around, they took women. My background in speech path was a big help there because uh, in endocrinology they were doing a project which required uh, the use of an audiometer. And the professor asked me, did I know how to work an audiometer? And I said, yeah, it was part of my training. By the grace of God, graduated and was accepted as the first female and the first 
junior intern at Children's Hospital in Montreal. Sylvia, what motivated you to go to medical school? The usual questions were, why are you in medicine? You know, it's a speech pathologist, and I kept saying, because the pediatricians need to know about these kids, because they're the first ones to see them when parents are concerned about delay in speaking or difficulty with speaking and learning. At that time, no children's hospital in the country had a speech clinic. I was invited to come to Children's in Boston and set up a speech clinic in the outpatient clinic. The physicians in training, like I had been, were concerned about physical problems. The students it, it, coming up, you know, and the house staff were concerned about sick kids. So who was going to refer to a speech pathologist or a speech clinic? But it was the practicing physicians in New England who gave one day a week to our outpatient clinic. Now these were guys in practice to whom parents were bringing children who, who, couldn't have, who had difficulty with speaking, who had difficulty with reading, who had difficulty with school, and they didn't know what to do with them. So I was getting referrals like crazy, and that was the beginning of the speech clinic. In medical school, our professor of neurology was Wilder Penfield, neurosurgeon, one of the greats and he taught us about dyslexia. So I learned the medical history of dyslexia in medical school and put that together with what I knew in speech path. And uh, so that's how I got started in dyslexia. How did you become acquainted with the Orton Dyslexia Society? I was uh, on the board of directors of ASHA, the American Speech and Hearing and Language Association and I became president of ASHA in 1993. As soon as I was all finished, I, I had joined Orton, but I began to go to the Orton meetings. It was in New York, and it was the Statler Hotel, and when I came in, Margaret Rawson and Roger Saunders were sitting on a couch, and she called me over. And I met wonderful people in this organization. Orton Dyslexia Society became home for me because these were the children who I love the most, who I think are the, have the greatest possibilities, and who are so wonderful. How did the term dyslexia evolve? It was parent pressure that did that. And it was parent pressure that got ACLD started and forced the schools to begin to establish programs for children with learning disabilities, which included our dyslexic kids, but that was a no-no word. You didn't say dyslexia. Yeah, I, I, I used the word dyslexia because I could tell the children about all these wonderful human beings who have dyslexia and that they could do that too. And they were so relieved to know that they had something with a name attached instead of something umbrella-like like learning disabilities. What method should be used to evaluate preschool children? I believe that if you're going to evaluate preschool children, you do not make a test and you do not have a series of tests that will tell you whether or not a child is dyslexic at that age. Um, you need to have a diagnostic preschool where you work with the children and determine what kind of difference they have. Are there characteristics that best describe children with dyslexia? There, so many of them are absolutely perfectly placed for this time in, in our world mm -hmm. because of their tremendous right brain skills. I mean, these kids can visualize, in, they internalize visual space. They think in 3D. Uh, they are creative, they can out-talk you, they can uh, out-fox you, uh, they get to, I, I keep thinking of them as kids who think around corners. Uh, a good example was one of my kids who uh, was a math genius, but he was flunking math because he got the answers in his head and he couldn't write it the way the teacher wanted to write it in that protocol. And he, I had to go to school. I said, you can't flunk this kid. He's got all the answers correct. Well, yeah, but he didn't prove them. Uh, 
he didn't say that. I said, he can't tell you how he did it, but he got it right. So he's a math genius, so he deserves an A+. Plus. Another kid, oh, we called Clay, his name was Kent. We called him Clay because he always had clay in his fingers and in his, in, in his fingernails and his teeth and his pockets. He always worked with clay. So I finally went out to lobby to get him. And while he was waiting, he had made me a little horse, about this big. And it had a flowing mane, it had a flowing tail, it had a saddle, stirrups, bridle. It was a wonderful little horse. And I said, Clay, how could you possibly have flunked art? Well, in her class, we got a paint. I said, well, did you mention to the teacher anything about your special ed or anything, you know, the way you think, or did you say, what did you, how did, what did you? He looked her in the, he, this is a nine-year-old, he said, I looked her in the eye and I said, I don't work in two dimensions. I just work in three dimensions. So I thought, okay. I took the horse to school to see this teacher, and I said, how could you fuck this child who can do this kind of work? He's a sculptor. She said, well, the curriculum demands that we teach painting. I said, and you can make no, you have no flexibility. You can't make any, any changes for a child. I said, didn't he tell you anything about the way he thinks? She said, well, I don't know. He talks a lot of, all the time, and he said something about dimensions. I didn't pay much attention, and I said, that's fine. We're taking him out of your class. Well, to make a long story short, Kent is now a very successful architect. He still doesn't work in two dimensions. He hires draftsmen. He makes models of his buildings, and he's highly successful. The young man who flunked math is now a financial expert, and he's on some big, huge board. I don't know the name of it, but I know he's worth a few million dollars, and I hear from him periodically that he's having a good time. So uh, I love these children because mm -hmm. they have such capacity. Mm -hmm. And in a world that's turning into technology, they can do it. How do you integrate technology into a school curriculum? Every classroom in that school is a smart board, and every one of those students has a laptop. They can, put it to, they can take apart and put together a computer. I saw geometric stuff going on in the smart board. And the only way I could pass geomet geometry was I, I cheated. So uh, it, you know, this to me is a fantastic skill. I can read, yeah, but I can't do so much they can do, and they will learn to read. Mm -hmm. So they've got both worlds, mm -hmm. and technologically they're going to be in, in, they're in heaven now because that's what everybody wants is technology. Nobody cares. Whether, I mean, the newspapers are going down the tubes. We're putting textbooks on, on Kindle, so everything's going techno. Sylvia, what advice can you offer from your lifetime of experience? Real advice is to parents. Stop looking at your children as though they have a disability. These are kids with abilities, not liabilities. Find out what your children do. Never mind what they don't do, they know what they can't do. You have to help them find out what they can do and let them know how important what they can do is. The same with educators, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. Stop thinking of them as disabled or handicapped individuals. These are individuals who you have to teach. And you're gonna have, if they can't learn to read, that's what you're gonna have to teach them. Mm -hmm. And if it's history or mathematics or whatever it is, your job is teaching. And your job is to be sure that you're reaching each child because they're all different. These kids are not disabled. There are no disabled children. The system's disabled. My mm -hmm. advice to pediatricians especially is to know what facilities are available in their own community that will help children who have difficulty learning. Because they need to know not only where the pharmacies are, but where are these educators who can help children with problems. This is part of their job. For all of us, listen to the children. Observe the children. 
be friends. So talk about a, a handicapped individual, a disabled individual. I'm a perfect mm -hmm. example. North is always in front of me. It doesn't matter where I am. North is in front of me, which means <laughs> south is behind me. And I know west is left because the vowels are the same, which leads east. And I'm safe if I'm going north. If I'm not going north, I'm lost. And for 45 years of a wonderful, wonderful marriage, my husband would say to me, Sylvia, go east, go west. I don't know where that is. And the important thing for his children is to know what their abilities are. And I think that's the best piece of advice I can give. Thank you, Sylvia, for all you have done to improve the lives of individuals with dyslexia and their families worldwide.